Welcome back. Panel is here. Joshua Johnson, host of 1A on NPR. Danielle Pletka of the American Enterprise Institute. Betsy Woodruff-Swan of the Daily Beast. And Dan Balls, the chief correspondent for the Washington Post. Peter Nicholas at The Atlantic wrote the following on Friday. The country is entering a new and precarious phase in which the central question about President Donald Trump is not whether he is coming unstrung, but rather just how unstrung he is going to get. The question is whether Trump's base starts to notice or care that the man it elected, facing pressures he's never seen before, is devolving unmistakably into a different sort of man. Joshua Johnson, um, it, it certainly feels like there's something different about the president this week, perhaps. Not to me. Yeah. I mean, people have been talking about whether Donald Trump is unraveling. I think he's just unwrapping. There is nothing that we've seen this week that is not of a piece with everything we've known about Donald Trump thus far. This is still the same person who has dealt in conspiracy theories, including against his predecessor, Barack Obama, who was in fact born in the United States. This is the same person who came to prominence through his reputation as a bomb thrower and a disruptor on this network, on The Apprentice. This is the Donald Trump we've known kind of throughout. I don't know why Washington has not learned the lesson that Maya Angelou tried to teach us. When people show you who they really are, believe them the first time. And I think what's more interesting whether, than whether or not Donald Trump is unraveling, which he's not, is whether or not his base is going to start to move away or, I would suspect, that this remains of a piece with the person yeah. they elected. So I'm not sure that this week for the base yeah. moves the needle. What may move the needle is the behavior and how Congress may react to that that forces him in another direction. But right. this is him. Danny, let me put it another way. Is this a week that Republicans in Congress started to get more uncomfortable with him? Yeah, I, I think there's no doubt about that. When you see the majority leader in the Senate coming after, coming after the President of the United States in the pages of the Washington Post, yes, I think that this is a real split. The question is, is it going to widen or is it just going to remain that way? And that, in some ways, that's up to the Democrats. Mm. This is, you know, we've talked about this again and again. If the Democrats end up with a far left set of choices, then the Republicans are going to stick with Donald Trump. If, in fact, it looks like there are other options, then maybe you're, you start to see uh, the split become wider. Dan Balls? Well, I think that the last several weeks, I think since Ukraine became the central issue. Since the start of impeachment, essentially. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I think we have seen a somewhat different Donald Trump. I mean, I take your point that Donald Trump is Donald Trump. Um, but I think that there has been um, a more sort of sense of defensiveness, a franticness on his part, um, a kind of a sense of urgency on his part to keep his view pushed forward. And I think it, it, it has manifested in a variety of ways. I mean, we've seen it in the tweets. Uh, we've seen it in Oval Office sprays. We've seen it on the South Lawn. We've seen it at the rally. Um, he is feeling under pressure in a way that I don't think he felt quite as much during the Russia investigation. At the same time, the shift in his behavior does also predate the initiation of the impeachment conversation. The longer he's in office, the more comfortable he is going with his gut, following his instincts, and jettisoning what his advisors tell him. And the Turkey decision was the perfect encapsulation of that. We saw him withdraw U.S. troops without any credible plan from his team. It appeared that there wasn't much of an infrastructure in place to do that successfully. And, and it's really significant, not just because of this trend line, but also because of how it impacts his base. A really important subplot of the last two weeks that's gotten lost because the last two weeks were so crazy <laughs> was the extent to which Franklin Graham, the son of Billy Graham and a really influential evangelical Christian leader was part of the conversation about Syria. Yeah. Once the president announced the decision to pull troops back, Graham actually urged his followers on Twitter to pray that Trump would change his mind because of the Christian communities in northern Syria who the Kurds protect. But when Mike Pence, who of course would be close with Graham, would be close with evangelicals, negotiated the ceasefire, if we'll, if we'll call it that, in Turkey, Graham uh, said it was great and came out in support of it. So it didn't, it didn't take much. I'm curious what you guys think of the Doral decision now overnight, because look at this. It, it feels as if maybe he actually got buzzed by the electric fence for once. Um, here were, there were members of Congress criticizing him that we had not seen criticize him before in this one. Here's Mike Simpson. You have to go out and try to defend him. Well, I don't know if I can do that. This was on the Doral decision. I think the optics aren't good, said Jeff Duncan. <coughs> Uh, but we have a lot more problems to worry about, South Carolina Republican. Tom Reed of New York, this is a legitimate criticism. The profit issue, that clearly has to be transparent. And then Marco Rubio's. I understand the arguments others are going. 
uh, to make. But as a Floridian, you know, I think it was good for Florida to have that event. But it did feel that is such as, a Florida thing to say. It, it was. It was. <laughs> Rick Scott didn't even hand ring. He just said, eh, there's no conflict of interest. Bring yeah. it to Florida. But it does feel like he, he knew that he was putting too much pressure on his own party. He was putting too much pressure on his own party. And I, I said this to you before the show. This is not just corrupt. This is like South Florida corrupt. This is corruption. You're taking sunshine. those tweets today, brother. You know what? Look, <laughs> I covered South Florida for yeah. a very long time. And you and I both know that region has oh, dealt in an yes. array of very open, naked, almost brazen corruption. Pay to play is sort of the first line of defense. The idea yeah. that the president would deal a federal contract to himself is unlawful. Right. Doral is a bad place to hold this event. It's right under the flight paths at MIA. It's surrounded by corporate headquarters, Univision, Carnival Cruise Line, the Miami Herald. It's inland. It's surrounded by property. You can't buttress it on one side with, say, water, which right. is what's often done at G7 summits. So it's a bad place. The idea that this is the best place in the whole country to hold the G7 is ridiculous. But beyond that, I'm not sure the G7 really cares that much because they have bigger things to worry about. This week, they were more concerned with Facebook's cryptocurrency called Libra and whether it would actually harm real currencies like the dollar or the euro. So in a weird way, that makes it even more South Florida corrupt because at the end of the day, it may not matter that it even happened at all. Dana. I don't know. I wonder. I mean, Donald Trump is so furiously adept at throwing stuff out to distract you from what happened last week. We've talked about this again and again. None of us can remember what the outrage of two weeks ago was because right. he picks another one. I wonder whether maybe he did this on purpose because it seemed so ridiculous. It seemed to confirm every single thing. Well, it seemed to be everybody the motive. What was weird, it was the motive to send Mick Mulvaney out there who created the disastrous quid pro quo answer. Yeah, it, 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 for me, it's inexplicable, but it did deflect fire onto Mulvaney, which is kind of interesting. Acting chief of staff Mulvaney, by the way. They always insist on calling him acting. I, you know, I assume we're days away from that. I, I, I guess I would disagree with you slightly just by the idea that this administration has never seemed to be that cleverly strategic in the kinds of things they do. I mean, it is chaotic in the way they operate. I, my, my sense on the on the Durrell decision is um, he's just got too many fronts that he's fighting right now and just take some of the pressure off, back yeah. away, and give his Republican friends or allies or, or critics uh, a, an opportunity to say, well, he did the right thing. The Mulvaney press conference was truly one for the history books. And for people outside the White House, many of his close allies, even before he got to the quid pro quo part, there was a lot of head scratching about the fact that the White House would have a press conference to brag about this particular situation the same week when they've spent tons and tons of airtime complaining about the Biden family because of this focus on how self-dealing, you know, the, the Trump administration was arguing, was inappropriate. It was, a, it was a weird call and obviously did not go the way they'd hoped. It was, and as everybody knows, Mick Mulvaney did not make that decision by himself. When hey, NBC News fans, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and then click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.